Hello, my friends. My name is Darren Gertis. I'm just a professor trying to provide context in the war in Ukraine. I also am a conservative Republican, not a MAGA Republican, but a conservative Republican. And I also support Ukraine fully. Now, I saw this article and I thought, you know, this resonates deeply with me and I think we should talk about it. So there is an opinion piece in the Kiev Post. A senior Republican speaks about the GOP and Ukraine. Now, the author is a Scottish professor who had an email correspondence with a uh, unnamed senior uh, Republican who, who has been active in multiple administrations, knew many of these for the last few presidents. Um, and so it, it doesn't matter what his identity is. Is this true? And I think there's a lot of truth to what we're about to see. He said, the, one of the questions to this guy was, you've chosen to stay in the party and fight for it. Now, a lot of people say, well, you just have to leave the Republican Party. It's not so easy if all, if not all, if many of your other values, except for Ukraine, are over on the Republican side. Even if MAGA has come in and warped and kind of mutated things, it's not easy to leave the party. And there's really no Democrat party that wants to have somebody with me with the rest of my values. But that set that aside. He says this, you've chosen to stay in the party and fight for it, even though you are deeply worried about what Donald Trump has done to the party and the USA. Why? And his response was very simply, the world needs a functioning Republican Party or else it will fall into disrepair or worse. I think that's fair. I think we need a functioning both sides of this because one will keep the other side on track. But the Republican Party has traditionally been very uh, hawkish about the world order post-World War II and watching out for bad guys, particularly dictators who might do bad things. The Republican Party needs to have a coherent foreign policy that engages the world, recognizing threats and appropriately dealing with them. Frankly, probably 80% of the party rank and file could agree with this statement. Now, there's a, a undercurrent of isolationists in the party now that weren't there maybe 10 years ago, but I think that's probably a fair statement. How can, how can we do that if we are not in the party? So that's where I am. I'm choosing to stay and fight for my party. Now, some people would say, well, you can't be a Republican and support Ukraine. Do you really want a system where half the country can't support Ukraine? Is, is that what you're saying? That's, that's ridiculous. It's, that's a pig ignorance. Okay, many of your readers may scoff at what I just said, but your readers are quite intelligent. So consider this. A third of the party would never support Trump in a competitive primary. Think Nikki Haley's vote, right? That actually happened. We saw that. A third of the party just wants to back the winner and fight Democrats. Well, I mean, that's true on the Democrat side. They just want to fight Republicans as well. There's a pr proportion there. These are tribal Republicans. And then a third of the party strongly backs Trump for a variety of reasons, polity, personality, etc. And I would say personality is probably probably the biggest reason there. They, they are following the individual and then saying, what, what's his positions on things? Okay, yeah, that, let's do that. So two-thirds of the party could or will back a candidate in the future who is a John McCain or a Nikki Haley Republican. Just as easily as Trump took over the party in 2016, his people could lose it just as easily in 2028. And I, I believe that that's also true. I, I, I believe that that is, there's going to be, there's nobody that's going to out-Trump Trump. And so you're going to have a lesser, even if you have people trying to advocate MAGA positions, it's going to be not nearly as forceful. I'm ready to fight for the party that played an outsized role in winning the Cold War. So the next question was, you followed the twists and turns to the Republican Party's internal debate over Ukraine closely. What happened to change things in the end? Easy question. It was the right thing to do, and it was now or never. The leaders realized that they couldn't wait any longer, and Ukraine needed supplies or else it would suffer catastrophic battlefield losses. It was also clear that Putin was not stopping in Donbass, and frankly, probably wouldn't stop with control over Ukraine. It was clear that weakness from the West in Ukraine would only encourage Chinese expansionism. So defeating Putin without one American soldier's life being put at risk kills two birds with one stone, stopping Russian and Chinese expansion. Now, it took way too long for Speaker Johnson to put that bill on the table, but that's the kind of case that uh, McCall and other re senior Republicans in the House and 
uh, McConnell and other Republicans in the Senate have been making all along. In your estimation, why did Speaker Johnson decide in the end to bring the Ukraine aid bill to the floor and then vote for it? Speaker Johnson was getting intel reports about the deteriorating situation on Ukrainian front lines. He had to make a choice, and he didn't want to go down in history as Neville Chamberlain. I, th I think that's probably a fair point, and he really had to wrestle with that. He's a good man doing the best he can in a job that he was thrust into under really unfavorable circumstances. Now, I realize that a lot of you aren't going to think he's a good man, but he really did come to this position in a weird way after the ouster of Kevin McCarthy, and then they couldn't find this candidate and this candidate and that candidate, and well, how about this guy? We, he doesn't seem bad, and maybe he was a little unprepared for the position and the excessive pressure that he had for MAGA and so on and so forth. What would you say was Donald Trump's role in all of this? Now, he says this, his role was minimal by design. In reality, Donald Trump despises war. Unfortunately, he also admires aspects of Putin's leadership style and despises Ukraine's leadership for perceived support for Joe Biden during Trump's presidency. Trump would much prefer to withdraw U.S. support for Ukraine and focus on migration and trade. Now, I think that's right. He doesn't like war reflexively. Now, remember when he came in, he was rebuking the Bush administration for Afghanistan and Iraq. He doesn't like war, that's correct. And he probably has a chip on his shoulder because of the first impeachment. And he prefers to stay in his lane, which is business. And he knows that he can drum up a lot of support about migration and working on that. So on each of these counts, I think the interviewee is correct. He also knows that he needs to win the election to stay out of jail. Well, that might be the case. Actually, if he get, goes to jail, he could theoretically win and then pardon himself, which would be very, very strange. Given that Nikki Haley's supporters are critical to his chances of winning in November, and those supporters care about Ukraine, Trump knew that he needed to kind of, sort of, punt on the Ukraine vote. If Trump had actually supported the Ukraine bill, then many more of his most diehard supporters in Congress would have voted yes. And I think that's a fair point. He didn't support it, but he kind of released it and like, okay, just go ahead and do the thing rather than come out and fully support the Ukraine bill. Okay, what is your best guess about how Nikki Haley Republicans vote in November 2024? He says that Nikki Haley Republicans will vote for Donald Trump in November. Unfortunately, tribalism is a powerful force. The USA is no different from other countries in this regard. Now, I'm not sure how many of those will actually do it. I think smarter ones will look around and if they can cast a protest vote, will cast a protest vote. I think it's going to be a really difficult sell in the seven or so battlefield states, but in the other 43 states, I think there's going to be a very good night for Nikki Haley to cast a protest vote to say, no, this is not what we're for as Republicans. What do you believe Donald Trump would do about Ukraine and Russia if he's elected in November? Donald Trump wants to avoid an inherited war similar to what Richard Nixon dealt with in Vietnam. Trump's plan will be to pressure Ukraine by threatening to cut off military aid to trade land for peace. Trump will then call himself a peacemaker and move on to other issues. That would be an ideal scenario for Trump. And Trump does what is good for Trump but it would be catastrophic for the rest of the world. Of course, in reality, this will solve nothing and just allow Russia to claim it defeated NATO and Europe, rearm, and try again to take over Ukraine from a stronger position in a few years. And I think that's pretty fair. If he, Trump, loses, what are the chances that someone like Nikki Haley could lead Republicans in a different direction? I agree with what the interviewee says here. And this is why instead of calling myself an ex-Republican, I'm staying within the party to fight for the party because I think this is correct. 2028 will be an all-out war between the one-third of the party that supports Trump and the one-third that is anti-Trump. The primary will be decided by the one-third of tribal Republicans who just want to back a winner and fight the Democrats. The anti-Trump crowd will have one big advantage. Trump will not be in the primary. All the aspiring wannabe candidates will try to mimic Trump, like Vivek Ramaswamy, and will fight for the hardcore Trump supporters, thus dividing them in an inverse 2016 scenario. There will be fewer candidates in the Nikki Haley traditionalist lane, and that's good because they can coalesce more rapidly. I truly believe that Trump is like Robespierre in this respect. He has very flexible ideology wrapped in patriotism. 
Now, that flexible ideology means he can go this way or he can go that way. We can't really predict what's going to happen. But ultimately, Trump cares about upending institutions, customs, and norms. That can't last for long. The question is what will follow Trump, because whatever does will write the rules of the road for generations. So tying everything together, if Trump loses in 2024, the odds are that a Republican will win in 2028. There's generally a flip-flop between parties at the national level back and forth. And that Republican will be from the non-Trump lane. It will fall to those of us who remain in the party to make sure that we quickly consolidate that lane, develop a cogent set of policies that appeal across the party, and bring back principles that encourage stability in the world. So those of you who are constantly talking about it's just the MAGA party, the Republican party's dead, I don't think that that's correct. Everything that I understand about the Republican party tells me that what this interviewee is saying is actually spot on. I believe that 2028 will be that year, and I want to be in the middle of that battle. So do I. That's why I'm still a Republican, and I'm a Republican that fully supports Ukraine and will continue to fully support Ukraine. Okay, tell me what you thought about this. Thank you for your time. Thank you for the likes. Thank you. Oh, by the way, if you're a conservative and this resonated with you one way or another, maybe you thought it was wrong, maybe you thought it was right, put... I'm a conservative and, and then put your comments about what you, what you saw about this. I, I really would like to hear your feedback, whether you think this is correct in the same way that if I was doing a, a video about what Democrats think about something, I would say, look, if you're a Democrat, I want to hear what you think about this conservatives, not so much because you'll have a different perspective than the people in the other party have, right? Thank you for your time. Thank you for the likes, the shares, the subscribes, and thank you for being the kind of person that cares about Ukraine.